Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for watching, thank you for listening. I've got an urgent message I want to give to you today. And it's regarding the climate, the political, geographic, geopolitical climate that we are living in today. And um, I'm seeing a trend developing and I want to share something with you in regards to that. Friends, I'm seeing, I believe, if I've identified it correctly, Lord willing, I'm seeing a move of nationalism rising again in Europe as a buffer against Islamic invasion, potential invasion that's coming to Europe. Now, I want to share with you some scriptures to tell you what it is I'm talking about and what we need to do as believers in Jesus Christ to prepare for it. But I've made a few notes here. Now, can I just read it to you before I forget? Because when I get on the screen, I forget my notes and I want to make sure I don't forget to read them to you, friends. The recent terror incident in Austria gave me pause for concern and it reminded me of back in history, time past, what happened with the Ottoman Empire under the leadership of Suleiman the Magnificent and what happened at the gates of Vienna. Now, I'm seeing if history repeats itself, and it does, I'm seeing a new rise, a confederation of European nations who are going to form together uh, an alliance, but it won't be religious, it won't be Christian West against Islam, it's going to be more nationalistic, and I'm seeing this forming right now, and if you take a look at what's been taking place in Speaker's Corner lately, with the, um, the presence of Tony, Tony, I'm going to say Tony because of the algorithms, Tony Robbins in the park and I'm seeing this alliance that is forming with very extreme elements within the Christian community aligning with the right wing nationalistic um, organisations. Now there is a difference friends between patriotism and nationalism. Now there's this ongoing discussion regarding what is the actual difference between them are there synonyms those two words nationalism and patriotism but i'm going to leave that up to you to decide friends you can do your own research into those two words i believe that patriotism is a good thing it's healthy where nationalism is unhealthy and it's not necessarily a good thing other thing i want to touch on this call for recognizing islamophobia and the blasphemy laws thanks to Pakistan's Imran Khan and Turkey's Erdogan, I see these two specific phrases that are going to be used more often now. We're going to begin to see these being discussed in the West and in Europe, how these Islamic leaders from these nations are going to want to make sure that these terms are recognized internationally. Why do I say that? Well, friends, in, in the Word of God, as you know, my channel is primarily Bible prophecy, and I've also done other things. I've talked about Bible doctrine, I've talked about core beliefs in the Christian faith, and I've talked about Islam, Muhammad, and what have you. And I've also gone into <laughs> certain conspiracy theories and looking to debunk those. But primarily, my messages are regarding Bible prophecy, the Word of God, and what it tells us we ought to prepare for. Now, there are people who are growing to understand this perspective regarding the Islamic Antichrist. Now, the Word of God is showing, I believe in my understanding, through the help of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, is that these beasts from times past, the leopard, the bear, and the lion, so we're talking about the Grecian, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian empires forming once again and becoming this entity, the beast, Antichrist, beast kingdom. And what is happening in the West is gradually, and I believe this is the beginning, you're going to begin to see more nationalistic um, groups forming a nationalistic front against um, the invasion of Islam. Not a religious, not the Christian West coming against Islam, but more of a nationalistic solidarity amongst European nations as a buffer to prevent the Islamic invasion, potential invasion that's going to come. We've lost, basically, as the West, Europe, 
we have lost the Christian foundation, our heritage. We've lost a lot of the core belief system and we've given it over to secularism and humanism. So you will see secularists and humanists also joining in within this nationalistic alliance that is forming now against the invasion, the threat of Islam, Islamic nations. The leader being the Sultan Khalif wannabe, other one right now. This Austria Vienna situation that just took place, I'm going to do a separate message on that and I want to go into history and what happened during the Ottoman Empire and the invasions that happened after that. I want to talk to you about that and I believe this part of history is going to repeat itself because if the Ottoman Islamic Empire is the seventh kingdom, the seventh mountain, the seventh head that is going to revive and come back to life, then I'm going to expect to see a very similar repeat of history that's going to take place, you guys. So we need to brace ourselves and be prepared in the word of God, in prayer and in fasting, friends. This is what I'm going to set my heart to do now in the coming days because we're going to need it and people are going to need to know what's happening. By wisdom and discernment from the Lord, we can help those people and give them answers as to what's going to happen and what is yet to happen, what's coming. Okay, friends, now let me show you what I have on the screen and I pray that you will stay with me to the end of this video. It's really important, friends. I love you and I appreciate you. Thank you. Okay, friends, so before I begin, let me just show you what I mean between the two words. What are the differences? This is how I see it and I found this. I'm going to share it with you just in case it causes any confusion. So let's just clarify what I mean. Nationalism or patriotism. So on the left, now if I zoom in, it will kind of um, disorientate the image. So I'm just going to leave it at that um, zoom level. Nationalism on the left, patriotism on the right. Okay, friends? So I'm going to read from the left. Nationalism means to give more importance to culture, language, heritage, whereas patriotism pertains to the love of the nation with more emphasis on values and belief. Nationalists are believers in the perfection of state, hence they never question the state, its intentions or its actions. Anyone questioning the state can make them anti-national. Patriots are believers in principle which the state may or may not reflect so they may support or oppose the state and still be called patriots. Nationalism can be aggressive at times and believes in supremacy of its nation. Patriotism is mostly benign and passive by nature and believes in equality of the nations. Nationalism is rooted in rivalry and resentment whereas patriotism is based on affection. Nationalists assume that their country is better than every country. Patriots believe that their country is one of the best and can still be improved in many ways. Nationalists cannot tolerate criticism and consider an, it an insult to the country. Patriotic persons tend to tolerate criticism and try to learn something new from it. Nationalists... <laughs> I'm going to have to scroll. Nationalism tries to find justification for mistakes made in the past. Patriotism enables people to understand both the shortcomings and improvements made. All right, got that over and done with. Now, when it comes to this rise of nationalism amongst the nation's friends against um, the Islamic threat, <clears throat> Islamic terrorism, extremism, right? The persecution of the Christians in those nations is going to increase. It's been happening in the Middle East, North Africa, now even South Africa now, with what's happening with Mozambique and Asia. But our response will have to be according to the word of God, friends. We don't retaliate. We don't fight back. We serve the Lord in all meekness and gentleness. And we testify of the Lord. And we also demonstrate how we are overcomers by the blood of the lamb as mentioned in the book of revelation and i'm going to go there but let us go back and and consider how the 12 apostles experienced <clears throat> martyrdom and i found this on christianity.com and uh, i'm going to read some of it to you friends 
They were not the kind of group you may you might have expected Jesus to send forth on his mission to reach the world. There was nothing special or spectacular about them. The twelve apostles were just ordinary working men. But Jesus formed them into the backbone of the church and gave them the most extraordinary task imaginable, calling the entire world, including the mightiest empire ever known, to repentance and faith in the risen Christ. You can be sure that any educated first century Roman citizen would have laughed at any prediction that within three centuries, the Christian faith would be the official faith of the empire. Let's go on. How did the apostles die? Now, I'm going to go through this briefly, but I I think it's important that we remember because they set the example, friends. If we look in the book of Acts, they set the example for us as does our Lord Jesus Christ and how his um, ministry, how he performed and how he behaved and how he commanded his followers to behave is so important, friends. It's going to be even more important for us in the coming days. Okay, friends, and I want us to be reminded of that, friends, because when things get crazy, when tribulation kicks off, it's going to look like there's no hope. Where is God? Why is he left us here? What's happening? What's going on? So we need to be prepared. All right, friends? Peter and Paul, both martyred in Rome about 66 AD. But remember, friends, it was for the cause of the gospel. They were preaching the gospel as commanded by Jesus Christ. They won many people over, thousands and thousands. They shook the world, friends, but they they did that at a price. It was a very costly Price and they paid with it with their lives as the Lord Jesus prophesied that that would happen. Andrew went to the land of the man-eaters in what is now the Soviet Union. Christians there claim him as the first to bring the gospel to their land. He also preached in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and in Greece where he is said to have been crucified. Thomas was probably most active in the area east of Syria. Tradition has him preaching as far east as india where the ancient martha christians revere him as their founder they claim that he died there when pierced through with the spears of four soldiers philip possibly had a powerful ministry in carthage in north africa and then in asia minor where he converted the wife of a roman proconsul in retaliation the proconsul had philip arrested and cruelly put to death matthew Matthew, the tax collector and writer of a gospel, ministered in Persia and Ethiopia. Some of the oldest reports say he was not martyred, while others say he was stabbed to death in Ethiopia. Bartholomew had widespread missionary travels attributed to him by tradition to India with Thomas back to Armenia and also to Ethiopia and southern Arabia. There are various accounts of how he met his death as a martyr for the gospel. James the son of Alphaeus is one of at least three James referred to in the New Testament. There is some confusion as to which is which, but this James is reckoned to have ministered in Syria. <coughs> Sorry. The Jewish historian Josephus reported that he was stoned and then clubbed to death. Simon the Zealot, so the story goes, ministered in Persia and was killed after refusing to sacrifice to the sun god Matthias the apostle chosen to replace Judas tradition sends him to Syria with Andrew and to death by burning John <clears throat> the only one of the apostles generally thought to have died a natural death of, a, of old age he was the leader of the church in the uh, Ephesus area in Turkey and is said to have taken care of Mary the mother of Jesus in his home during D- Domitian's persecution in the middle 90s he was exiled to the island of Patmos. There he is credited with writing the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, friends. An early Latin tradition has him escaping unhurt after being cast into boiling oil at Rome. <clears throat> Let's just read this shortly. The names of Jesus' apostles have become the most common names for males in the Western world. How many do you know named John, Pete, Tom, Andy, Bill, Bart or Phil? Friends, have you noticed how now the name Muhammad is becoming the most popular name for men in the Western world? 
at least it is so in Europe. What do we make of that, friends? What's happened to the so-called Christian Western values that we once held? They're being eroded, friends, and there's a vacuum that it has been created. Secularism, humanism, Islamism is moving in. And that's going to produce a lot of nationalistic um, backlash against Islam, Muslims. And this is what we have to expect is going to happen in Europe. The scriptures I want us to go to <clears throat> is, let's begin, Revelation chapter 20. Let me see if I can uh, just bring it up here. <clears throat> oh, I haven't coughed all day. Start talking. The saints reign with Christ for a thousand years, and this is um, an account of what will happen in the future when the Lord Jesus returns. And he is bound, Satan, the dragon, with chains, <clears throat> and the Lord's reign begins for a thousand years. But listen what it says here Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. <clears throat> And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded, for what reason? For their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands and they those ones friends and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand year were finished this is the first resurrection blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Do we avoid martyrdom, friends? Do we protest, oppose, demand our rights, our human rights against the Islamic hatred? towards us no we don't we don't petition we don't protest because this is a part of our lot as a believer in Jesus Christ as soon as you enter the kingdom we are in spiritual warfare immediately we have been given a target and Satan will be relentless we don't protest it we don't despise it we don't complain, we don't whine about our freedom of speech being infringed upon, our rights of freedom of expression being infringed upon. We don't complain about those things, friends. Those issues are what the nations of the world will complain about, the secularists, the humanists, the nationalists. For you and I, the standard is higher. The bar is higher than that. The bar is the example of the Lord Jesus and the apostles. We humbly commit ourselves to our Father. We resist Satan and he shall flee from us. This is a spiritual battle, a spiritual warfare that has taken place and it's going to intensify, friends. Does that make sense? Do you get what I'm saying? Or is there a misunderstanding anywhere, friends? more scriptures to follow but let me show you this what I found on open doors in relation to persecution preparing Christians for persecution that is the mission of open doors worker Nathan all over the Middle East and North Africa he visits Christian leaders with open doors persecution big 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 picture training providing them with a biblical theology on persecution and practical advice on how to deal with it when it comes I want to put this um, link in the description so you can read it completely yourself but let me read some more when do you feel persecuted 
When this question is raised in a room full of Christian leaders all involved in supporting the persecuted church in the Middle East, at first they are silent. But after a moment of hesitation, when they sense there is a safe atmosphere, they dare to, they dare to speak out. I feel persecuted when I take a public bus and the driver puts on a CD with Quranic verses on maximum volume. There is just no way to ignore it. They are forcing me to listen, one of the participants says. Anything done publicly in Jesus' name will get us in trouble, another adds. Speaking publicly against the teaching of imams and mullahs is also very problematic. And being in the company of Christian believers from a Muslim background, that would definitely get me in trouble. <clears throat> We are visiting a three-day training on persecution preparedness in a country of the Middle East. Open door, Doors worker Nathan is facilitating this training, which he has been given, been giving over across the Middle East, North Africa, the last few years. The purpose is to help them make sense of their persecution by giving them a theology of persecution. It prepares them, friends. Both priests and pastors opening up the expressing how hard it is for them, friends, to live amongst the Muslims in these Islamic nations <clears throat> and how to cope, basically, faithfully, scripturally. <clears throat> the Open Doors Developed Persecution Big Picture Training tries to provide answers to the questions by digging into what the Bible has to say about persecution. A key passage in the training is Matthew chapter 10 verse 11 through to 42 where Jesus prepares his followers to be persecuted, hated, excommunicated and even killed for following him. Remember this is for his name's sake. This isn't about freedom of speech, freedom of expression. This is for his name's sake. When you're preaching the gospel even when you are um, targeted or isolated and pointed out to be a believer and follow Jesus, we will be persecuted, hated, excommunicated and even killed for following him. Remember my last video, Speaker's Corner, my last video, please watch that one friends. I go through so many scriptures to show you the attitude, the character, the response of St. Paul and the early disciples, the followers and how they, through the mighty grace of God, persevered patiently reasoning reaching out to the lost despite severe opposition and there are our example friends again I said this is going to be a quick video so let me get on with it here on nbcpathway.com it's a wonderful thing here. It was written earlier, <clears throat> last month now. Of course, we are now in November. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Let's stand, struggle, witness with persecuted believers. November the 1st marks International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And this is what I wanted to talk to you about yesterday, but I didn't get around to doing that, friends. I don't think my father will kill me. It's a wonderful article, friends. It's so important that we check this one out and I will put this in the description box. There is no persecuted church. That is, that this is the reality for Christians across the globe, I have no doubt as such. I was dumbfounded when I first heard someone claim that there really isn't a persecuted church. Yet, in an important way, the person was right. There is no such thing as a persecuted church and a free church. Because what they're saying is there is only one church, friends. However, in the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ addresses seven churches, does he not? And they were all located in Turkey. So we have this understanding that as a whole, as the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, we collectively are the church. And the church will go through tribulation, persecution, testings and trials, friends. I'm just preparing you through the Word of God. Another scripture I want to share with you is the very words of our Lord Jesus in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, from verse 3. The signs of the times and the end of the age. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming 
and of the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumours of wars, see that you are not, not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, nationalism, ethnic wars, racism against kingdom, <clears throat> nations against nations. And there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So we see that when this nationalistic kind of climate is going to increase, friends, we see that it's going to be formed as a buffer, as a front against the threat of Islam, Islamic nations, ISIS, <clears throat> who are invading nations crossing borders through immigration and causing havoc it's going to get worse friends so we don't protest that we are prepared <clears throat> by faith in jesus christ we look for his return look for his coming and we're prepared for it friends we know what's going to happen this is why i talk and share with you my studies regarding the antichrist there are many people who don't study these things who don't look into it it's important friends because those days are approaching nearer and nearer there's one more scripture I would like to share with you. Hold on one moment. Let me go and find it one moment. Okay, so there we go. Revelation 13. I've read this particular chapter loads of times, friends. I love the word of God. I love the book of Revelation. But let's read the entire chapter and listen what it says look at how the saints are mentioned here during this terrible time that's coming the beast from the sea <clears throat> let me just get my cursor set then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and on his horns ten crowns and on his heads a blasphemous name now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, the Grecian Empire. His feet were like the feet of a bear, the Medo-Persian Empire. <clears throat> Excuse me. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion, the Babylonian Empire. In fact, for more information, please refer to my other videos. Let me just see if I can get that up. And it's I have a playlist here. Islam, Antichrist and Mystery Babylon. Please check that video link, the playlist. Um, what's the other one there? Please go to that one if you can on my playlist section, friends. Islam, Antichrist and Mystery Babylon. For more information, more detail, more Bible study regarding this portion of scripture, especially the end times. Let's carry on. The dragon gave him his power, his authority and great authority. <clears throat> his throne. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. And I believe this is the Ottoman Empire, the Islamic, Sunni, Turkic, Ottoman Empire. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? <clears throat> Listen what it says. And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. Friends, the stuff that other one is saying right now, the stuff that the leaders of Iran say about death to America, death to Israel, and what have you, that's nothing compared to what this guy is going to be like. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Here we go. It was granted. Who granted the dragon to do this, friends? Who's ultimately in charge, friends? Who has everything under his control? Our Lord, our God, the Almighty. 
It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. The saints specifically mentioned the saints. Now we're going to see Islamic nations rise and get more hostile towards the Christians, but also the nations of the West, Europe, the Arabs even, Israel included. In fact, with Israel, fascism, neo-Nazism will be directed toward the Jews, friends. That's to be expected also. History is going to repeat itself. It always does. And it's for a reason. It's so that we would learn the lessons of history. But many don't learn, friends. Many forget. Many have a short memory. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. He mentions this also in the book of Daniel. That the little horn will overpower, weaken, tire, to make weary the saints. And when our power is completely gone, shattered, that's when the Lord Jesus will return. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Focus on this friends. Verse 9. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who, lead, who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. That's the way it is, friends. That's the way it's going to be. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. We have faith in our Lord because he promised, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And we have the patience of Christ. We long for the Holy Spirit to grant us all the fruits that he brings with him, including patience, including long-suffering, right friends, self-control. This is our attitude, friends. This is what we need to prepare for, okay? This is how we do it. People say, well, how do we prepare? By faith and with patience. Entrusting our souls unto him. Revelation chapter 6, from verse 9, it talks about the fifth seal. Let me read. When he opened the fifth seal, this is the Lord Jesus opening the seals, friends, because only he is worthy to open them. So we receive this as a blessing, as a mercy, that he opens the seals and we receive it in Jesus' name. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and for their testimony which they held and they cried with a loud voice saying how long O Lord holy and true until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth did they protest to the nations to the governments to the politicians no by prayer and supplication with intercession with cries, they lift up their cry to the Lord. How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood? Why? Because God said, I shall repay. Vengeance belongs to me. We don't protest. We don't demand our rights. We are not from the far right. We are not a political movement. Our kingdom is not from this, from this realm, you guys. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
and you were able to receive this. Then a white robe was given to each of them and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. Should they protest? Do they demand their rights? That they should rest a little while longer. These are the souls of those who have been slain. So their souls are with the Lord in his presence. But their souls were still crying out. Imagine. But they were told that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. It's sad. It's provokes us to outrage when we see how Islamic terrorism is destroying the earth, nations, countries, innocent people going to worship, being killed, blown up, heads being chopped off. It enrages us, friends. It hurts, it but breaks our hearts. But what do we do? We commit ourselves to the Lord. There's a time coming when he will judge and avenge the blood of those who have been slain, friends. We commit him. We trust him. This is showing him trust, knowing that he is more than capable. Friends, the, the Lord Jesus is returning in great wrath. He's coming with judgment. Why do you think he's going to come with a sword with his garment dipped in blood? Recompense, the day of recompense, vengeance, friends. We don't demand recompense. We don't demand vindication. We don't demand our rights. That is not of the Holy Spirit. The attitude is not from the Lord. We have to humble ourselves, be meek, gentle, lowly in heart. May you watch this one more time, go over this video again and understand what the message is here, friends. I know many of you do. You understand it. The Austrian terror incident, ISIS motivated, and that's linked with Turkey. I'm going to talk about that in my next message. All these events lately, the speaker's corner, hostilities increasing, the teachers being beheaded, Lee Rigby, remember what happened to Lee Rigby in East London? <sighs> the cartoons drama. This is all going to lead to nationalism versus Islam, friends. Nationalists versus Islamists. Not Christian West versus Mohammedans, no. Christianity in the West has been muzzled for a long, long time. It's created a vacuum, friends. Fascism, new and neo Nazism towards the Jews. Friends, we just need to prepare for tribulation. We need to understand Bible prophecy, friends. Please come back, check my old messages and my videos to understand what the scriptures say, where we need to look, what to prepare for. We must endure to the end, friends. We have to be ready to testify because we overcome Satan by the word of our testimony and even be willing to be killed for it. Not for standing up for our rights, not for criticizing others, not for prov provocation, not for insulting, mocking other people. That's not from the Lord. Is so that our testimony could go forth, that we could give glory and testify of the salvation of our great God and Saviour. This Islamic Antichrist beast is rising. It's rising. It's in motion now and you see the effects in the coming year. Nations in Europe have begun to realise the Ottoman Empire revival is taking place 
and now history is going to repeat itself. To understand what I mean, we need to understand what happened during that time in history. And I'm going to go through that again in my next video. Thank you for watching. Please share this. Please watch it one more time. Go through it again slowly. Pause. Consider prayerfully. And please leave me your feedback. I appreciate it. I love you. And I'll speak to you soon.